Welcome, welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection for another very important subject. This is David Parram, your host. Uh, if you do Facebook, I ask you to find us at AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection and uh, share the, uh, oh, first follow us and then share the show with family and friends. This is very important to us. We have an extremely, extremely important topic today is Latinos cancer survivors and fighters. Latinos, cancer survivors and fighters. Very, very <laughs> uh, important topic, touching, um, uh, I guess, serious. Uh, it's got a, a lot of elements to it. And we have three uh, important and, and very, very special guests today. I'm going to introduce them right now. I'm going to try to use my notes in my memory, but first of all, I want to welcome to my left, I believe you are Marina Sandoval. Yes. All right. And you are the Community Development Manager for the American Cancer Society. That's correct. Uh, okay. So remember to kind of keep the mic close, uh, and even as you move, kind of, if you can kind of rotate, because... So I really want okay. the voice to be captured by... Uh, your voice to be captured by the mics. All right. Then we also have... Uh, Vanessa Ramirez. That's and me. That's Vanessa right here. <laughs> and Vanessa is a cancer survivor, and she's also a volunteer for the American Cancer Society. She's also involved with the Cancer Action Network for the American Cancer Society at the national level. Welcome. Thank to you. I didn't say welcome, did I? But welcome, Marina. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, and then uh, Monica Miller. Monica Miller is a registered nurse. She's a breast cancer survivor. She's board of the, we call we call it NAN, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses Phoenix Chapter. Yes, Yay. got it. <laughs> uh, she's also a board member of the Latina Strong Foundation and part of the Latinos Contra el Cancer. Uh, 2018, a portrait of hope for American Cancer Society. Uh, Monica, welcome. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. Today. All right. We have a very important topic today, and I'm going to try to stay away from you because I know that uh, you know the, sub the subject, the topic, and we want to really convey a lot of things today. Uh, I'm going to start with a question, and I know this probably was not in the script, but especially you, both of you are cancer survivors, correct? Correct, yes. Let me ask just a very general question. What comes to mind when you hear the word cancer? If we can start with you. Um, well, I was diagnosed at a young age of 23, um, and I think where I was in my life plays an important role of what I think about cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't ever a word that we talked about in our family because we were lucky enough to not ever have anybody be diagnosed with cancer. So for me, what I think about when I hear the word cancer at that age was hair loss. Mm, okay. I mean, that sounds so vain, but that was the first thing I thought, I'm going to lose my hair. Okay. I didn't even think about the survival. It was the, the physical component that mm. came with it. Wow. But now... I mean, obviously, it's a little bit different because I've educated myself. And we will ask you a, a little bit later on to share your story, but I'm sure that it basically uh, covers your family. Everything. It's everything in your life uh, changes. How about you, Monica? The word cancer, how, how do you hear it? I mean, I'm sure that having gone through it, it, it it's, you know, it's, there, it's loaded. It could mm -hmm. be loaded. That Very. Word. And it's not a word that... Um, you want to hear directed at you with that diagnosis. Um, and, and, but when it happens and when I heard it, first thing that came to mind was fight. Mm. Like I got this, I'm going to fight it. And I stomped my foot down and I told my doctor, I don't have time for this cancer stuff. I said another word, but I told her, I, <laughs> said, I don't have time for this. It doesn't fit in my life. Wow. And she just gave me a hug and said, we're going to get through this. Because not only she was my physician, my ob guy, and she was a friend of mine. Um, we were colleagues. And um, I went home. It was on March 17th, uh, 2015. So it's a little over four years. Um, it, was, so it was on St. Patty's Day. And I remember going, oh, my gosh. You know, um, it was a shocker. Hmm. But I had it in my head. You know what? I got bad news. Um, however, I'm going to make the most of this and I'm just going to keep fighting through. And that's how I the, looked at the it. Death uh, came into the picture at all? Uh, 
not necessarily, but for me, what I felt was, of course, death is going to happen anyways, regardless, right? We're all going right. to get there sometime. We don't know what that plan is, you know, but um, I knew in this one that, um, and with breast cancer is a little different because when it does metastasize, um, it metastasizes in other places, mm. um, like the bone and the brain and the liver and the lungs. And so it's really sometimes when women that pass away of breast cancer, you know, metastasis, and people are like, oh, she died of lung cancer. But really, it's it's the cancer that metastasized in right. that area, breast cancer. So, yes, there's always that little part, I think, and uh, that's there that goes, oh, God, please don't ever come back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's there to the thought of, but meaning, gosh darn it, I've got this day today, I'm up, I'm breathing, I'm good, I'm healthy, and I'm going to live it, right? And so that's how I, I Perfect. feel. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to pick up the, f get the phone out of that. Uh, okay. Yeah, so because. It, that like karaoke? Yeah, I think that would okay. be a lot better. Can I come back to you, Marina? Uh, tell yes. us a little bit about the American Cancer Society. Uh, I believe that uh, in many, many important uh, efforts uh, there's always a national office right i mean okay. aarp it started as a national office now it has state offices in every state of the country but it tends to happen where big efforts you know start at the national office right. and then they kind of uh, branch out into the states can you right. uh, educate the public and me as to uh, what how, how do we understand the american cancer society what is it when did it start what did they do etc yeah, so the American Cancer Society is a national organization, and it's an organization that is 106 years old. Hmm. Um, it, we have chapters just like the one um, in our Arizona location across the nation. And so the American Cancer Society mission is to save lives, celebrate lives, and lead the fight against cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we strive to do that through um, various aspects. Um, number one is through research. Um, we are the largest nonprofit funder of cancer research in the nation. Mm -hmm. um, we also do that through our programs and services like our transportation um, our transportation program for cancer patients so that they can get to their treatments and our lodging program as well too so that cancer patients and their families have a place to stay if they have to go out of town or receive treatments um, we are able to provide that service for them as well um, and we also have our uh, cancer action network as well too which is our um, our advocacy arm of the uh, american cancer society um, and really helps to promote policies um, at a local, state, and national level um, in order to uh, promote the, the policies that help cancer funding um, at those levels as well. So uh, I understand that uh, we're, you're going to be announcing this amazing effort called Latinos Contra el Cancer, correct? I know we're going to take a break in about a minute and a half. Can we start that, uh, that at least uh, the introduce the concept of Latinos Contra el Cancer? What is it? So when I was doing a lot of volunteering through the Cancer Action Network, I noticed that, you know, the people who were volunteering weren't reflective of myself, of my community, mm -hmm. my people. So that's where with Marina and myself and a couple other volunteers, we thought about developing an arm called the Latinos Contra el Cancer mm -hmm. to really reach out and educate our community in both languages. Uh, that, that seems to be pretty typical, but it, I, I applaud you for for I applaud both of you because so you you came into you know the 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 cancer society, you got involved, you volunteer, and then you realize that your people are not going to come approach this for help or f to seek any information unless you know there are people that look like them. So you basically saw that and it initiated with both of you. Well, absolutely, as a cancer survivor myself and being diagnosed at a young age it was hard to connect to anybody who wow. had ever had a cancer mm. history in my family or within my network so mm. yeah i did not i had that void while i was going through my own battle and we are going to pick up this very topic on the second but monica are you excited about this effort i mean what what is that going to do to the community this is going to offer so much support to the community. And uh, we thought that, you know, when I um, met up with Marina as well, so Marina has in her uh, 
in her position at the American Cancer Society had reached out because I was one of the portraits of hope anyways. And with Vanessa, I already knew Vanessa. because she was, I mean, it's all this octopus of arms everywhere mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. touch and that Especially we've when you're started active in this. the community, you tend to exactly. kind of gravitate and, one another. Um, she had ideas and she shared them and, I, and that's how kind of, and so she talked with all of us and then we started off with a group of four of us at a table and mm-hmm. next thing you know, you know, it's um, growing. So what it's going to do for the community um, and our Hispanic community is provide outreach, provide the resources, provide, you much know. Much needed? Much needed. There yes. isn't a lot of uh, support for people who deal with cancer at, uh, in, in the valley or in the state at this point? You know, just to kind of touch on that is we want to take it a step before that, let's talk about preventative care. What right. is it that we can do mm. to educate our community so that they're not having to get the resources for cancer? Perfect. Let's uh, take a break right here. Uh, stay with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. The topic today, Latinos, cancer survivors and fighters. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. I, I, I don't know. I, I think I haven't said this in about two or three programs. I'm very excited. <laughs> I, I have a, a privilege to do these kinds of shows because, you know, I, I get to address a lot of issues. And so many times I'm the first one to learn. And, and I am so glad that, that we're doing this show. Much needed. Let's continue. Uh, we have Marina. Uh, let me go back to my notes. Marina Sandoval. Uh, Mo, uh, Vanessa Ramirez and Monica Miller with us today. Uh, they are basically launching an effort uh, that is linked to the American Cancer Society. Yes. And this is called Latinos Contra el Cancer. Latinos Contra el Cancer. And I asked them off the air if they all, uh, all three of them are bilingual. And indeed, they are bilingual because I have to believe that having been exposed to what you found at the American Cancer Society and uh, what led you to form this, obviously you want to serve both uh, communities, those that uh, prefer English and those that speak Spanish, correct? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this uh, uh, idea, the motivation behind starting Latinos Contra el Cancer and uh, how you see it. Uh, is there going to be a launch about this and, and all that? If you can kind of elaborate a little bit more. Thanks, David. So, yes, um, Latinos Contra el Cancer, as uh, Monica said, we started with four of us and we've nearly quadrupled in size as far as the board members. We have a great amount of people who are striving to be part of this organization. Um, we developed this because we wanted, We our mission was to focus on three areas, which was education and advocacy. Mm-hmm. Um, community engagement and fundraising with each each of those would we would go into the community whether um, it was I- any community that we knew was a high Hispanic Spanish speaking community where we can be out there with our other volunteers who are bilingual just to present information um, that you know these people or people who are going through cancer have access to such as rides hope lodge Um, there are so many things that I took advantage of and, you know, I share, you know, the resources with everybody I can. So Latinos Contra el Cancer really was started by us because we saw a lack of representation within 
the American Cancer Society. And no fault to them, because mm -hmm. I think it takes two, one, our community, and them to recognize that, hey, we're part of this community. Absolutely. So I think we've both kind of come to the table and said, you know, you come 50-50, we'll come 50-50. And you know what? It's really, really flourishing. So I'm excited to... We have a couple events of events that one we've already participated in, which again have been more um, events where we're just out there getting our name out so people can come and mm -hmm. feel like they can approach us because we look like them, we speak like them. Right. The other one is going to be the fundraising efforts, but a fundraising effort and events that we can do where it's, you know, with Latinos. We're family oriented, you right. know, I'm bringing my kids, I'm bringing my husband, we're bringing our theos, our cousins. We, that's just how we travel and that we, the events we, we attend, we, we attend in groups. So right. we have a couple events that we have planned that are going to really bring out our community and we're, we're going to be happy to share that. Definitely. Uh, if, if you can share this, what is the scope of, uh, the, 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 the scope of, of life? When somebody is dealing with cancer, I mean, what are the the different areas, arenas that they're dealing with the needs? I assume that support groups might be something. You mentioned rights. I mean, what? I mean, when family is there, great, but sometimes it may not be there. So, what is the scope of needs that people are living when they have been diagnosed or are dealing with cancer? Uh, and you know. Let me kind of just touch on this. Is sometimes you don't know what you need okay. until you're in that situation. Mm -hmm. yes. Someone might have the stable family, but maybe they don't feel comfortable talking to their parents about, I don't want to scare them with this cancer word, or I don't want to sh you know, share too much. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have maybe the financial support or the health insurance mm -hmm. in place, but maybe you don't have that um, emotional support where you're able to express yourself freely mm -hmm. and talk about the fears that you have with this, the fears of losing your hair, the fears of you know, losing your breast, the fear of all these things. So sometimes you don't know, but that's why we're here to expose what we have to offer and let our people know that you are not alone in this battle. Mm -hmm. right. So, and Monica, I don't know, as another cancer survivor, if you can kind of touch on that as well. Mm -hmm. I can touch on it as well as a cancer survivor, but but as uh, more importantly, I think, well, I, I was very uh, blessed, but meaning with the family support and with insurance and, you know, all those wonderful things. However, at the same time, like you said, the emotional support. And sometimes you're, like I said, I was like fight. Mm -hmm. I was like in that fight or flight mm -hmm. type mode. Mm -hmm. And then a few months later, well, I think fighter, about right? it Yeah, later <laughs> on, it really, then it hits you and you go, why am I feeling? Well, then I was on tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. okay, and tamoxifen is a estrogen blocker. So meaning an estrogen. So what it does is a hormone blocker and it, I was starting to feel down and the effects of the medication. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to be on it for five years. Well, mm -hmm. I could only tolerate it for so much because I was like, look, quality versus quantity. So then I was dealing with that because it's, you know, you're like going, am I shooting myself in the foot by not taking this? So you deal with so many other things as you right. go through your journey. But as a nurse, I used to actually be um, the work in our women's clinic at Maricopa Integrated Health System. I still work there, but I used to work in our gynecology, oncology. Mm -hmm. I was a gynecology, oncology nurse, okay? So I worked with the women who had ovarian, cervical, and um, ovarian and cervical and uterine cancer. And um, their needs were huge because a lot of them did not have insurance. Amazing. Mm. So the needs there and American Cancer Society also is there at Maricopa Integrated Health System as support for those um, patients and folks that, that are affected by this and the families to offer them these resources. Mm -hmm. But not only do they offer them the resources, we I mean, we also do as a whole and there's a community has to come together of how can we try to save somebody's mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. right, without right. the support, without right. them having the access and being right. able to apply for Medicaid and these kinds of issues, too, right? right? So that all comes into play here, too. Uh, so she just, uh, Monica just mentioned that the American Cancer Society was there. Uh, so is that a function also? Do you do that through volunteers, perhaps? Or how, how do you reach out to people who are going through this and where? So, for example, at Maricopa Integrated Health Systems, we have a patient navigator. Mm -hmm. And so they're there to help the, the patient and their families kind of go through this process, go through this process and share the resources that we have available through the American Cancer Society. 
a lot of times people receive this diagnosis and they don't know what to do with it. So mm -hmm. the patient navigators are in these health systems um, in order to provide that support um, and as well as serve as a resource for them through their cancer journey. Uh, the support, does that consist of making sure that they, the insurance piece of it is, is, is taken care of? Uh, and then maybe family support? What what uh, what does the support consist of other than the insurance piece of it? So uh, as far as the insurance piece of it um, is concerned, the American Cancer Society is able to connect patients and their families with partners and, and organizations um, that we have through the uh, American Cancer Society to connect them with those um, vital resources like insurance um, in order to ensure that they're getting the treatment and the services that they need. Right. Can now, I, uh, go ahead. Okay, Ma so on that note, so they are at MIHS, uh, Maricopa Integrated Health System. We are soon going to be Valley Wise Health. We are changing here probably in another month mm -hmm. um, to that new name, but we are still the same. We are the public safety net of Maricopa County, mm -hmm. okay? So that's why, like, American Cancer Society is there, and they're so vital in, in who we serve because we serve a lot of the folks that are underserved. So we offer a sliding fee payment. So if you're not, a, you know, you cannot apply. If you cannot uh, get into access, we have sliding fee system. And there's um, other places that offer that as well, but that we are the public safety net, so we do have that. And like I said, they are also a support to what we offer, and it's just, it's a great relationship. Let me just come back to you, uh, Marina. The funding for the American Cancer Society is not that robust, I understand. Uh, do, do people donate to the, uh, uh, to the American Cancer Society? I mean, what are the funding sources typically, and how are the fundings doing? Yeah, so the the main source of, of funding for the American Cancer Society is donations from mm -hmm. the public. Mm -hmm. um, so we are a very reputable organization, and we are in communities, in hundreds of communities across the nation. And so through um, our different events like Relay for Life, Climb to Conquer Cancer, um, our Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Walk, those um those events bring the communities together. It allows them to um, honor a loved one that has that has cancer or mm -hmm. passed from cancer right. um, and give them a platform to fight back. Got it. Now, the funding that you will be raising, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, that's going to be primarily for the Latinos contra el cancer. Is, is that the case? So the funding um, that we are, the fundraising that we are um, initiating through Latinos Contra el Cancer is going to go directly to the American Cancer Got Society. It. And so those funds are going to help us fuel our mission, like the programs and services that we offer, like transportation and hotel lodging for cancer patients to stay while they're receiving their treatments. Got it. Uh, just a, a question to you, Monica. I know that you are a board member of Latina Strong Foundation and then NAN, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses in Spanish Chapter. Um, are they going to be involved somewhat in the effort uh, as a support, as a sponsor, supporters uh, in any way? You know, that that's a great question, David. Mm -hmm. October 12th, a Saturday, uh, Latina Strong and um, is going to be hosting at U uh, Univision a um, a what would it be? We're calling it the, it's about breast cancer, okay. but it's an awareness um, day um, regarding breast cancer. It'll be a brunch. Um, we will have many other support there. So I know National Association of Hispanic Nurse will have a booth. I had already spoke that Latinos con real cancer. So alongside, and we will have folks, I would actually um, like uh, Marina to speak as well at the, um, at the event. And so, yes, there's partnerships because we can't do it alone, right? Mm -hmm. And we are all, like we said, it's like this, you know, when you're involved in the community, we all get to know each other. I already knew her before. She's been a, you know, and it's, it's a wonderful uh, collaboration amongst all of us in the community. Before we go on our second break, uh, let me ask you just a very general question. There, there are many, many types of cancers, right? Yes. And, and when you have events, so people come from all different experiences, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. 
so at this point, this is still going to launch. It's not like you, you did it already. And, and you've been volunteering for the American Cancer Society already, so you kind of know what, you know what it is. Have you done many volunteering before, or this is your first engagement? The volunteering with the American Cancer Society that I've done was um, outreach on behalf of when, last year for the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer um, walk. I was one of the, chosen as one of the Portraits of Hope. So I did do some uh, education. And I did, alongside with Latina Strong and Nan, we did a um, breakfast, like I said, a, a brunch, um, bringing awareness for breast cancer last October, right before, and raised some money for the walk. So, yes, I have Perfect. volunteered. We will continue, and in the le next segment, I'm going to ask you to share your stories uh, about cancer survival. I think uh, uh, we need to hear that story, and it'll, it'll be very... Uh, very good for the public to hear it as well, and especially for those that are going through through an experience like this. Stay with us. Uh, this is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. We'll be right back. The topic today, Latinos, cancer survivors, and fighters. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. The topic today is Latinos, cancer survivors, and fighters. Uh, let's uh, go into the next uh, uh, session that we uh, ask you. If you wouldn't mind sharing your stories, I think uh, it's going to be very good. And we have uh, we can use up to you know close to 10, 10 minutes of five each. So take your time and just kind of uh, take us through the you know. Your, your experience to the level that you feel comfortable with. Okay. Um, so I was 23 years old when I was diagnosed, and I was diagnosed with what is called ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. That has the name as, of uh, the silent killer mm -hmm. because by the time people realize that they have this specific cancer, it's typically too late. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to find it in the first stage but at the age when I got diagnosed, I was very vulnerable. I was a student. I was single. I didn't have a boyfriend. I mean, all these parts of my life are really important to talk about mm. because when I'm sitting there by myself with my OBGYN and she's telling me, hey, we found something, I'm just like, okay, like, uh, I'm only 23 years old. You, you tell me what the next steps are, you know? Mm. So for me... It was really hard to kind of digest that. So that's why I had mentioned, you know, what's the first thing you think about when you have cancer is your hair loss. I was already thinking, I need to go buy a wig. I need to figure out how to, like, you know, because you're vulnerable. Right. So that part of my life, I, you know, I would say that, you know, I lived with my parents at that time. I had my little sister. But for me, it was like they, my parents didn't know how to talk about that. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what the next steps were. So we were clueless in this together. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I don't think, I know the, the word death came up earlier. That never crossed my mind at that young age. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is because I was young. Mm -hmm. As a mother and a wife now, oh, hearing that word would scare me, mm -hmm. you know, tremendously. Right. So... Because of my age and, you know, lack of information and um, I don't want to say support from my family, but 
I just didn't know what the next steps were. It was, let's get rid of this cancer because I have to graduate and I have things to do with my life. Amazing. That was my mindset. Mm. So I kept my story to myself. Obviously, people who knew me, that were close to me, knew my story. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I was like that girl with cancer. You know, mm -hmm. that's just like the label that I'm <laughs> pretty sure that I had at, during that time period because mm -hmm. I was that girl with cancer. But, you know, since then, I've lost family members. I've lost dear friends that were young. Mm -hmm. And I realized, like, I cannot stay quiet anymore. Mm -hmm. I need to share my story because mm -hmm. if there's anything that I can share about my struggles, whether it was my financial struggles, my emotional, my my support, whatever it was during that time period, if somebody could hear it and resonate with it and it can help them mm -hmm. be prepared, then I'm going to do that. Right. So that's when I started getting involved through another uh, counterpart um through the American Cancer Society. So at that point, that's when I started advocating and talking about my story. And it goes even further is, you know, I'm Latina, I speak Spanish, I have tios, I have tias, you know, the word cancer was, oh, do, do. that wasn't a word we talked about. It was right. never a word we discussed. So for me, um, now I've decided to share my story and be at, vocal about it wherever I can be and hope that it inspires somebody. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully that title of the girl with cancer has now changed to, you know, Vanessa, the advocate, you know, against right. cancer. Mm -hmm. So yes. the, uh, the issue of uh, money, uh, expenses, insurance, how was that handle? You were on, still under your parents, you said, right? You know what? Things work out in a real mysterious way. Mm. You know, that's what I've learned from this whole experience. I actually was let go from my job. I was like a receptionist at a law firm that they were down. Actually, I think they were completely splitting. Mm. So I was the first one to be let go. But one of the gals there um, who I was very close to, she knew she knew everything that was going on with me. And they kept me on their health insurance. Mm. Amazing. They kept me on their health insurance. I didn't pay. You know, like I'm saying, I'm I'm lucky. I'm lucky in the sense that I didn't go into financial debt. I'm lucky that I had the financial support. I had the emotional support. I, I had so many good things going on in my life that I couldn't have, you know, focused on this negative part. But it's something that needs to be highlighted because it's not always that pretty. How was the process of your dealing with medically and then how long? So with my cancer, I, with ovarian cancer, I had to get my I actually had to go through surgery and this is where the vulnerability and the age factor come in is that they wanted to remove both of my ovaries. Mm. And at that age, I mean, I've never had, I still didn't, I didn't have a kid. I didn't have a relationship. I had nothing other than focusing on finishing my education. So for me, those were big answers of to course. have to like, or big decisions to make at such a young age. So that's where I talk about, you have to be your own advocate. You have to a ask questions. Mm -hmm. There's no question that is a stupid question, mm -hmm. especially when it's, you know, coming to your life and it can be a life or death question. Like mm -hmm. you need to, you need to ask these things. So, so you opted for just one. I opted to remove the ovary. That was the, the one that the tumor had encapsulated. Right. Correct. So at least gave me hope in case, I met my future husband, which I have, mm -hmm. and, you know, I wanted to have kids, and I did. So, Amazing. you know, my, my story didn't turn out too bad after all. So how, how long was this process? Sorry, um, I had to go through nine rounds of chemo. So the way it works, it was three days back to back here at, it was called Good Sam back in the day, mm -hmm. three days of chemo, and it was just the most annoying, time-consuming thing. I was just like, look, can we strapped us onto a backpack. I have class to go to. Like mm. it, like Monica said, I don't have time for this in my life. Mm. There is no time for me to be mm. battling with cancer. So for me, it was more of an inconvenience because I had to be there four or five cool. hours hooked up to a machine. You know, you're getting this chemo. Your eyes are looking like, you know, you, you feel, essentially you feel a little drunk because your eyes are going all over the place because, mm. you know, the medicine that's coming in, you know, pretty, strong. pretty mm -hmm. strong. Two weeks to the date from when I had my first chemo is when I started noticing like my hair kind of coming out. And that for me, again, was like that's part of us as a woman. We're vulnerable mm -hmm. and we're, you know, we're vain that we let our breasts and we let our hair define us. And that was something that at a young age I had to get over real quickly, mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. you know, so three rounds for three weeks. Um, so a total of nine um, 
chemotherapy so sessions. So time-wise, was that a year, two years? No, for me, it was about years. a month and a half. Oh, that yeah. was pretty short. And something I always, yeah, and something, something I always express to people who are going to start their chemo process, and I always say, do not be alarmed when they have to push your chemo back. Mm. Because after you get chemo, they wait about a week, and then you have to go get blood work to see where your blood count is at. Mm. Because I have to make sure that your your blood count is at a certain level in order for you to hit you again with this chemotherapy. So around my last session, it did get pushed back about a week, week and a half, because my numbers were too low. The doctor wanted my blood count to be up before he started my last session. So Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> How about you, Monica? That was a wonderful story. And you hit on something that really, you know, back then when you really did have an angel uh, in that office because mm -hmm. the laws have changed. And I don't think you were at that time of the 20s when they bumped it up to 26 where the parents still covered you. Correct. See? So... So you that did, happens yes. prior when she was 23. Well, that happened the, how many years ago, right? So right, right, she's right. she's now, 14 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe that law wasn't set in place. So had she made have been not somebody without, you know, right, that right. was going to face those other mm -hmm. issues to boot. So mm -hmm. you did have an angel. So that. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Um, so I was this is uh, like I said, um, I this is back four years ago, four and a half mm -hmm. years ago. And I was jogging. I was due for my, I did my mammograms, you know, every year, right after 40, on the nose. And I have dense breast, and I already knew that. And when you have dense breast tissue, um, you, and fibrocystic breast, that means they are a little bit lumpier at certain times of the month, things like that. You know, you need to really, it's real important to be checking your mm -hmm. breast and being aware of what changes are within your body, right? Mm -hmm. And I had, was due for my regular mammogram mm, that, that next week. And I went to jog, and something felt like a bee sting right at my, the top of my areola. And it made me grab that mm -hmm. area. And I said, ow, that hurt. Don't ask me if that was an angel. You know, we, they come mm -hmm. in different ways. Yeah. And I kind of grabbed myself there and pushed in. And I was like, that's odd. This feels like a lump, but maybe a little different. Mm -hmm. So when I came home, I had my husband. I said, feel this. He knows it. So I called my doctor, who was my OB guy. And we worked together because I was working at the women's clinic at the time mm -hmm. at Maricopa. And I called her and I said, will you order me a, I understood what I needed, a diagnostic, right. which is a mammogram that need, that also is a ultrasound along with it. And actually, with dense breast tissue, that should be your standard of care. And mm. women need to be educated to kind of fight for mm -hmm. that and bring that up. Mm -hmm. Because, um, so my doctor ordered me the diagnostic, which then they did the ultrasound on me. Um, because the mammogram, honestly, when they put them up back to back, the mammogram versus the last year's mm -hmm. mammogram, mm -hmm. they look the exact same. Hmm. My cancer was hiding behind that dense breast tissue. Had I have not found that wow. and asked her to order right. the ultrasound, hmm. um, I would have, uh, they would have said it's negative because it yeah. was hiding by, and mine was even a 3D mammogram, okay, the hmm. logic. So long story short, very important. I felt it. I didn't let up on it. Mm -hmm. um, she ordered that for me, and thank God it was found at stage one invasive mm. ductal carcinoma, so it came out of the duct. Um, I ended up having to have all three surgeons that I went to and before I chose one, mm -hmm. um, discuss it with all said that I could have a lumpectomy with lymph node dissection, check the lymph node, it was negative there, mm -hmm. and internal radiation to the breast. And then they sent my tissue off to be, that was the longest, was waiting those three weeks to mm -hmm. know, once again, the hair, am I going to lose my hair? You know, um, and I was lucky that mine came back at a lower level and I did not have to have mm -hmm. um, chemo. But I did have radiation, the lumpectomy, the lymph node dice. And, and so I was very fortunate in that. Um, but I found it early. So that's why I yes. realized the importance of getting out there and speaking to our community because it's a cultural thing as right, well. Right. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to check themselves. They don't want to burden any, you know, some of the women um, about this. And we need to act on it quickly and find it in the earlier stages because mm -hmm. you it's saving saving your life right? so how long the, was the period that you had to go through this so i was diagnosed on saint patrick's day of 2015 um i think 
I believe I had my surgery in about a month later. Um, and then from there, a week later, they did the, um, the radiation. And um, I had to go two times a day. I had to have this little friend inserted into me, you know, mm. and I had to. So I went twice a day for the radiation for the week. Um, so a total of a couple, about from the time of diagnosis to the end, about a month and a half, two months. Um, of going through that but then the worst part honestly was the tamoxifen and I was supposed to be on that for five years but that is like an everyday type of a chemo that you're supposed to take it's, an ev- it's a pretty heavy duty medication mm. for me it was some people mm-hmm. can tolerate it a lot better but. right mm-hmm. and David I think I think Monica and I both agreed on this is it doesn't matter your journey when it starts um, it's that day you get the release to you're good you mm-hmm. don't have to fall. it's the after effects of having oh. to heal is mm-hmm. really so even, even when the doctor says you're okay it's still not over oh your emotions I'm you're mm-hmm. i'm dealing you're dealing with the emotions of everything putting your life back together mm-hmm. wow. without mentally. having mentally physically emotionally mm-hmm. financially mm-hmm. putting your life back together after that because you're not seeing the doctor to see how you're doing mm-hmm. you're not seeing the nurses who hi you look great today you're not having that Mm. interaction that you've been used to so Mm -hmm. it's the after that's really also part of that battle Mm -hmm. let's take our last break Uh, stay with us this is aarp arizona hispanic connection the topic today latinos cancer survivors and fighters we'll be right back Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. The topic today, Latinos, cancer survivors, and fighters. I uh, I appreciate that you uh, are willing to share your stories. It's just amazing. And we have uh, the American Cancer Society as a umbrella, and we are learning of a new effort called Latinos Contra el Cancer, who is going to be launched when again? Uh, are we talking about days or months? Well, or Latinos weeks? Contra el Cancer has already officially been launched, okay. but we're kind of keeping under the wraps a big event that we're going to be announcing. What's today, Thursday? Oh my gosh, tomorrow. Sorry. We're going to be announcing tomorrow. Um, so if you follow us on our Latinos Contra el Cancer Arizona page, um, we will be announcing um, a very special and unique event that is really going to bring our community together. So Mm -hmm. since you mentioned social media, I assume it's Facebook? We have Facebook, we have LinkedIn, when we have Instagram. Uh, Is that the same name? Latinos Contra el Cancer. Oh, that's going to be easier. So if you are out there, you do social media, remember, Latinos Contra el Cancer, and you can find them in Facebook, LinkedIn, and And Instagram. Instagram. 
Uh, I saw you. I saw I saw you uh, the other day on Yay. Facebook and LinkedIn. Okay, good. And I said, wait a minute. That's, I know that's those the, faces. The, that's yeah. the effort that I were hosting yeah. on the show. <laughs> good. Yeah. And just uh, coming back to you, Marina, because uh, you know you and I haven't spoken as much because obviously it was a, the uh, just from hearing. Then what what comes to mind? I mean, I'm sure you you've heard of family members or friends that go through this. It's, isn't that encouraging, amazing that that they uh, overcame uh, this this horrible thing? It is. And I mean, talking about angels, these two I see as angels because they are on the front lines. They are fighting. They are powerhouses that are using their voices to to change the mindset of people in our community who might be afraid to talk about um, cancer. And so I'm really encouraged and inspired by them. I've also lost family members um, to cancer and um, have friends of the family that have cancer as well too so it's a, it's a mission that I'm very passionate about um, and the American Cancer Society has really given me a platform um, to, to speak out to to advocate and to to fight back against this disease that has taken so much already um, and so through Latinos Contra el Cancer our mission is to empower the Hispanic Latino community right. with the resources necessary to fight back. Right. I would just say that if there's any uh, anybody out there who's already involved in some kind of, uh, even if it's informal organization or coalition that that are that, that is offering support for cancer survivors to tap into you, right? To come in and, and kind of join forces. So I think it's, uh, as uh, they say in Spanish, la unidad hace mm -hmm. la fuerza, right? Absolutely. So we right. I definitely would like to. And, right. and we'll see uh, when we can do this show in Spanish as well. I think it would be at a certain at a a certain time that we feel convenient, especially once you launch some of the efforts. Let's, uh, we only have about uh, eight minutes. Uh, so I did hear that in, in your sharing that it's not only when somebody has been uh, has been diagnosed and is going through this uh, experience, but there is the element of prevention. What uh, what uh, are those elements of prevention that you will be speaking about uh, as you do your community outreach? Well, one of the things that with again the Latino Hispanic community is there's a lot of things that are taboo. You don't talk about maybe the problems that you're having at home. You don't talk about certain things. I mean, certain, I mean, I would say you could even say the word breast or talk about your private parts, you know, because that was very taboo. So I commend you having three women and being comfortable <laughs> talking about all our different body parts, because I think that's the first step is let's just take the stigma off of these words that mm -hmm. we have been, I don't want to say shamed, right. but it's something that we haven't been comfortable about. I think the next step is just being open and talking about our, not necessarily our stories, but, you know, issues that we're having. Because as women, I say we really hold down the fort at home. We're the one making the appointments. We're the one getting the kids ready. We're the one doing dinner, lunch, et cetera. So sometimes we put ourselves last. Mm. And we have to recognize that, that prevention true. will come once, If you know, both, uh, both Monica and I have both said, the reason we found our cancer is because we knew something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. We couldn't tell you what it was. It just wasn't right. Mm -hmm. So we encourage people. That's the first step. Recognize your body. You know what's normal and what's not normal mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially with your spouse, if you're noticing maybe different behavior or different things, maybe they are going through something because I've heard stories where ladies get diagnosed and they take a while to tell their husbands or their mm. children. Mm -hmm. You know, one of our lovely volunteers didn't tell any of her family for two years. Wow! So that's her family. Mm -hmm. So just being able to talk about it really kind of leads mm -hmm. into acknowledging maybe something's not right, which then leads into let's get into a doctor. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a doctor, there's access. We can help you get access to different providers. Mm -hmm. Let's find out what's going on. Hey, it might not be anything, but if it's something... Right. Maybe we catch it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So for us, that's where that prevention comes is, comes in, where we can come in, talk to our people in their native language with their kids, with their husbands, whoever it is, and provide the resources that will be able to help them if they ever find themselves diagnosed with this word. Right. Before I, I we continue with this, uh, you know, the, the signs and, and symptoms and resources that we're going to talk about. So when you do events, is that going to be branded as Latinos contra el cancer or the American Cancer Society? 
as a big as the umbrella, so to speak. Right. So it it's going to be promoted as American Cancer Society Latinos contra el cancer. And that's important because I'm sure people will see it in, in you know we'll we'll promote it when you do anything. Just send it to me and I'll promote it in our Facebook page. And Thank I'm sure you. many will. We appreciate and that. And they will have you on the radio as needed. Uh, but uh, it is important that the audience who's listening to ra by radio and or watching by uh, by Facebook Live that they know. So it'll it'll still be branded as American Cancer Society. Latinos contra el cancer. Correct. Perfect. Uh, so that's going to be very important. Uh, can we uh, share just a little bit about signs and symptoms? I, I think that's important. Yes, it is. Um, as far as uh, breast, I mean, I can speak to a lot of different um, cancers, but I'm going to hone in. Uh, something different, just like Vanessa said. Maybe you have more bloating. Maybe you've got a cough that isn't going away. Okay. Maybe on your skin, for skin cancer, you have a scab that's not healing. Mm. Mm. All these different signs so that there's skin, there's um, um, breast. You've got uh, something different about your breast. You look at yourself in the mirror, and maybe one of them looks a little off-centered mm -hmm. or um, the shape of your areola, or you have uh, um, some kind of a discharge that's not correct mm. coming from I that area. Say, I would say uh, um, energy. Energy, I think for Lab, me, it was, yep. and I mean, you're tired. I thought I was sleeping because I was a college student. And when I go back, I couldn't believe how much I was sleeping. Mm. I mean, it was literally attacking me and yeah. draining me. So. Yeah. Right. so you have to listen to your body and know what to, you know, those signs and right. symptoms, as well as get your exams. Um, people need to know what's covered under the Affordable Care. I mean, the screening exams are covered. Right. And, um, you know, and you've got to, we have our, um, um, mammograms, our, our um, uh, pelvic exams, women, you know, the well, well women's right. exam, that's, that's one of them, colon, mm -hmm. you know, you're checking colon cancer is a big one. Um, if you have any kind of... Does um, that affect more women or men, do we know, colon cancer? We wouldn't be able to tell you this, the stats, I, but our next show will be ready for yeah. that. My father <laughs> is a colon cancer survivor, so I had to get screened at 40 versus 50. Mm -hmm. So 50 is your marker for colon. However, since my dad had it and he's still alive yay um i i get i get screened every year for the or, just or, uh, on, excuse me not every year at 40. symptoms uh, it's the menstrual period is is there any signs there that of some signs of so of i do want to chime cancer. in on that okay, if you ever go to the doctor and you're feeling you know if you find yourself having to start this journey just ask as many questions mm -hmm. if things don't make sense to you just ask the questions because for me i was actually treating for a doctor and one of the symptoms that I didn't realize until after I got diagnosed, like I was, it was con I had constipation. Mm. They were giving me Metamucil at 21 years old, 23 years old. Like I didn't, I mean, I was perfectly healthy. Mm. So then they try to put me into this category of endometriosis, which because of my age mm -hmm. and hormones and puberty, they thought maybe it was. And I kept on saying, no, this is what I'm feeling. And it wasn't until they finally eliminated all those no's mm. that we got to my answer. And wow. I wouldn't have been able to get there without asking these questions. Right. Do you consider that you were very proactive in pursuing those? Absolutely. Uh, you questions. have to be proactive. You have to be. You you absolutely, you are your best advocate. Right. Yes. And, and Marina, can you just share, we have a couple of minutes at max. Um, in terms of resources, what right. can people expect to get from the American Cancer Society and eventually through the Latinos Contra el Cancer? So I personally feel that one of our key resources is our 1-800 number. 1-800-227-2345. Okay. It's a 24-7, 365 a year, day, year hotline where anybody can call in, even if it's just a question about cancer mm. or you received a cancer diagnosis and you're not sure what your next steps are. And when the doctor was talking, there was like a blank stare and it just went in one year and out the other. Or, or if you're looking for support, the emotional support is so needed as well, too, throughout this journey. And so they're able to provide that as well, too, and connect patients and their family members to the resources that they need to get to treatments to get the the hotel and lodging um while they're receiving their treatment as well too perfect uh, let's, oh, we, gonna, we have about 30 seconds okay real quick this is a big one um for uterine cancer i was just going to share because this is a biggie um well and vanessa is correct ovarian is usually found at the late stages so i'm so glad that you just kept persisting because they always think it's oh you're bloated oh you're this and they start looking at other things because it's especially when you're young 
uterine cancer after your age of menopause, if you start bleeding, having menstrual cycle again, you think it's a menstrual cycle, mm. but that could be a sign of uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so go get checked. But also with that, you can ask for tumor marker tests yourself and say, how about order me the CA-125? And that is, if that's elevated, that could be a sign of the uterine. So yeah. there are things that you can ask for if you educate yourself on mm -hmm. these items and push for them. Monica Miller, uh, Vanessa Ramirez. Ramirez, and Marina Sandoval. Sandoval. Oh, I almost got it. Thank you so much. It's been a, 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 an amazing program. Thank you for, for joining us today. And thank you also for joining. And don't forget to visit Latinos Contra el Cancer on Facebook and join us next time. Take care. Thank you, thank David. You. Thank you.